This lecture will go over diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. These two disorders have one thing in common, and that is that the disorders are affected by antidiuretic hormone, ADH, also known as vasopressin, right? So the thing that diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone have in problem is that they both involve ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. They're different in in regards to how the ADH occurs in the disorders. So for example, for diabetes insipidus, there's an ADH or an antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin deficiency. So the ADH is low or the ADH is there but the kidneys don't respond to it. So ADH is not doing its job in diabetes insipidus. In syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, the ADH is there and it's in excess. So when you're thinking about what ADH is, antidiuretic hormone, right? So looking at antidiuretic, what does that mean? Antidiuretic, antidiuresis, antiurination, antipene, um, right? So when we're talking about diabetes insipidus, which is what we're going to talk about first, we're talking about a disorder of the posterior, posterior pituitary gland in which water loss is caused either by antidiuretic hormone deficiency or an inability of the kidneys to respond to antidiuretic hormone. So if we have an antidiuretic hormone deficiency, do you expect your patient to be urinating more or less? Right? So antidiuretic, antidiuresis, antiurinating, antipene deficiency. It's not there. That means you're going to see excessive water loss through urination. The result of diabetes insipidus is the excretion of large volumes of dilute urine because the distal kidney tubules and collecting ducts are not reabsorb, do not reabsorb water, thus leading to polyuria, excessive water loss through urination, dehydration, and disturbed fluid and electrolyte balances. So diabetes insipidus, again, don't get it confused with diabetes mellitus, or when you think of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and the pancreas and insulin, you're talking about diabetes mellitus. This is totally different, totally separate. Diabetes insipidus is a disorder of the posterior pituitary gland and involves a deficiency of ADH. Dehydration from massive water loss increases plasma osmolarity and serum sodium levels, which stimulate the sensation of thirst. Thirst promotes increased fluid intake and aids in maintaining hydration. If the thirst if the thirst mechanism is poor or absent, or if the adult is unable to obtain water independently, dehydration becomes more severe and can lead to death. Ensure that no patient suspected of having di diabetes insipidus is deprived of fluids for more than four hours because he or she cannot reduce urine input and severe dehydration can result. There are different classifications of diabetes insipidus. Primary neurogenic diabetes insipidus is caused by defect in the hypothalamus or pituitary gland resulting in a lack of ADH production and release. Secondary neurogenic diabetes insipidus is not caused by a direct problem with the posterior pituitary gland, but is the result of tumors in or near the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, head trauma, infectious process, brain surgery, or metastatic tumors. Nephrogenic di diabetes insipidus occurs when the ADH is there, but then the kidney isn't responding to it, so it's a kidney problem. Drug-related diabetes insipidus is usually caused by lithium and demeclocycline. Most symptoms of diabetes insipidus are related to dehydration. Key symptoms are increase, an increase in the urination and excessive thirst. Ask about a recent I ask about a history of recent surgery, head trauma, or drug use such as lithium. Although increased fluid intake prevents serious volume depletion, the patient who is deprived of fluids or who cannot increase oral fluid intake may develop shock from fluid loss. Symptoms of dehydration such as poor skin turgor, dry or cracked mucous membranes may be present. Please review uh, chart 62-5 which is key features of diabetes insipidus. Here is another visual of diabetes insipidus. If you want to pause the video and look at this one on your own, you can. 
Water loss changes blood and urine tests. The 24-hour fluid intake and output is measured without restricting food or fluid intake. Diabetes insipidus is considered if urine output is more than 4 liters during this period and is greater than the volume ingested. The amount of urine excreted in 24 hours by a patient with diabetes insipidus may vary from 4 liters per day to 30 liters per day. Urine is dilute with a low specific, specific gravity less than 1.005 and low osmolarity. All right, so let's do a quick review. Diabetes insipidus, which gland are we talking about? We're talking about a problem with the posterior pituitary gland. Which hormone are we talking about? We're talking about antidiuretic hormone. Is it too high or too low? With diabetes insipidus, the antidiuretic hormone is too low, or it's there and the kidney's not listening to it. But too low, not enough a di antidiuretic hormone doing its job. In terms of signs and symptoms of di diabetes insipidus, what are we looking at? And for signs and symptoms, we're talking about not enough antidiuretic hormone. We're talking about the patient having polyuria, increased urine output, a dilute urine being um, excreted, and we're looking at signs and symptoms of dehydration. So now we're going to talk about interventions for diabetes insipidus. The most preferred drug is desmopressin acetate a synthetic form of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone that's given orally, sublingually, or intranasally. So again, the problem here is not enough ADH. The treatment is a synthetic form of ADH, desmopressin acetate. For the hospitalized patient with diabetes insipidus, nursing management focuses on early detection of dehydration and maintaining adequate hydration. Interventions include accurate measuring Accurately measuring fluid I's and O's, checking urine-specific gravity, and recording the patient's weights daily. Urge the patient to drink fluids in an amount equal to urine output. If fluids are given IV, ensure the patency of the access catheter and accurately monitor the amount infused hourly. Check the patient with permanent diabetes insipidus. The patient, I'm sorry, with permanent diabetes insipidus requires lifelong drug therapy. Teach the patient that polyurea and polydipsia are signals for the need of another dose. Drugs for diabetes insipidus induce water retention and can cause fluid overload. Teach all patients taking these drugs to weigh themselves daily to identify any weight gain. Stress the importance of using the same scale, weighing at the same time of day, and wearing similar clothing. If weight gain of more than 2.2 pounds, along with other signs of water toxicity, such as a persistent headache, acute confusion, nausea, and vomiting occur, instruct the patient or family member um, that the patient must go to the emergency room or call 911. Instruct him or her to wear a medical alert bracelet identifying the disorder and drugs. Next, we're going to talk about syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. While diabetes insipidus is a, was a problem with a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH, is caused when vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone is excreted even when plasma osmolarity is low or normal. So with SIADH, it's an excessive amount of antidiuretic hormone. So with an excessive amount of antidiuretic hormone, would you expect, expect your patient to be urinating more frequently or less frequently? Right, we'd be urinating less frequently. I'd have a lot of antidiuretic, antidiuresis, anti-urination hormone in my body. It's gonna cause me to, to urinate less frequently. So what you're gonna see is a lot of these hormone uh, disorders, you have a right hand and a left hand. So in this case, you have diabetes insipidus on one hand, and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone on the other. They're both dealing with the same hormone, but different problems, and they're sort of opposites of each other. So with uh, SIADH, the vasopressin secretes even when plasma osmolarity is low or normal. Feedback mechanisms do not function properly, and water is retained, resulting in hyponatremia or decreased serum sodium levels. In terms of assessment for SIADH, we wanna ask the patient about their medical history, which may reveal conditions that can cause SIADH. Uh, information about the following conditions is obtained. Recent head trauma. 
cerebrovascular disease, TB or other pulmonary disease, cancer, we want to know about all past and current drug use. Also, any decrease in serum sodium levels. Early symptoms of SIADH are related to water retention dilution of serum sodium levels leading to hyponatremia. So if my body's holding on to a lot of excess water, right, that's diluting my blood, which makes, if when I get a blood draw, it would make the numbers for my sodium level be low. GI disturbances such as loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting may occur first. Weigh the patient and document any recent weight gain. Use this information to monitor response to therapy. In SIADH, free water, not salt, is retained, and the dependent edema is not usually present, even though water is retained. Water retention, hyponatremia, and fluid shifts affect central nervous system function, especially when the serum sodium level is below 115. The patient may have lethargy, headaches, hostility, disorientation, and a change in level of consciousness. Lethargy and headaches can progress to decrease responsiveness, seizures, and coma. Assess deep tendon reflexes, which are usually decreased. Vital signs changes include full and bounding pulse, caused by an increased fluid volume, and hypothermia, caused by central nervous system dysfunction. Water retention causes urine volume to decrease and urine osmolarity to increase. At the same time, plasma volume increases and plasma osmolarity decreases. Elevated serum sodium levels and specific gravity reflect increased urine concentration. Serum sodium levels are decreased often as low as 110 because of fluid retention and sodium loss. Medical interventions for SIADH focus on restricting fluid intake, promoting the excretion of water, replacing lost sodium, and interfering with the action of ADH. Fluid restriction is essential because fluid intake further dilutes plasma sodium levels. In some cases, fluid intake may be kept as low as 500 to 1,000 mLs per 24 hours. Dilute tube feedings with saline rather than water and use saline to irrigate GI tubes. Mix drugs to be given by GI tube with saline. Measure INO and daily weights to assess the degree of fluid re restriction needed. Remember, a weight gain of one kilogram is equivalent to one liter of fluid. Keep the mouth moist by, by offering frequent oral rinsing. Warn the patient not to swallow the rinses. In terms of drug therapy, drug therapy with vasopressin receptor antagonists or Vaptins, such as Tolvaptin or Conovaptin, is used to treat SIADH when hyponatremia is present in the hospitalized patient. These drugs promote water excretion without causing sodium loss. Administer tolvaptin or conovaptin only in the hospital setting so serum sodium levels can be monitored closely. Diuretics may be used on a limited basis to manage SIADH when sodium levels are near normal and heart failure is present. Hypertonic saline, such as 3% sodium chloride, is used to treat SIADH when the serum sodium levels are very low. Give IV saline cautiously because it may add to existing fluid overload and promote heart failure. Monitor the patient's response to therapy to prevent the fluid overload from becoming worse, leading to pulmonary edema and heart failure. Monitor for increased fluid overload, such as bounding pulse, increased neck vein distension, crackles in the lung, dyspnea, increasing peripheral edema, and reduced urine output, at least every 24 hours. Pulmonary edema can occur very quickly and can lead to death. Remember, one of the key features of pulmonary edema is that pink frothy sputum. Provide a safe environment if serum sodium levels fall below 120. The risk for neurologic changes and seizures increase as a result of osmotic fluid shifts in brain tissue. Observe for and document changes in the, brain, in the patient's neurological status assess for subtle changes such as muscle twitching, increased irritability, restlessness. Check orientation of time, place, and person every two hours because disorientation and confusion may be present. Reduce environmental noise and lighting to prevent overstimulation. Flow sheets recording neurologic assessments and lab data are helpful in detecting neurologic trends.